Outlet Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio. My name's Sam Hales. I am the editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That is the magazine that sponsors this show. If you would like a free sample copy of our latest issue of the magazine, you can head to our website, premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Simply type in your details and we'll be happy to send you a free Premier Christianity magazine, the very latest issue containing lots of great interviews, features, news and more. But today on The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio, my guests today are Stuart and Jill Briscoe. Stuart was born in the north of England in 1930. After leaving school, he embarked on a banking career, serving in the Royal Marines during the Korean War, and then at 17 years of age, preached his first sermon. Since that time, he's ministered on every continent, written more than 40 books, passed the church for 30 years, and founded a media ministry called Telling the Truth. And Telling the Truth, of course, broadcasts here on Premier Christian radio you can hear it here and uh, has been here on premiere for many many years so it's very special to have both Stuart and Jill Briscoe as my guests in the studio today Jill Briscoe was born in Liverpool England in 1935 educated at Cambridge University she taught school for a number of years before marrying Stuart raising their three children and in addition to sharing with her husband in ministry and in pastoring a church in the USA for 30 years Jill has written more than 40 books and she has also served on the boards of Christianity Today and World Relief. She now acts as executive editor of a magazine for women called Just Between Us. And of course, Jill and Stuart Briscoe can both be heard on Telling the Truth here on Premier Christian Radio. But it's great today on the profile to hear some of their life story and go behind that programme to find out how it all began. So let's listen in to this interview I recorded with Jill and Stuart Briscoe. Jill and Stuart, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Am I right in thinking that you've been married for over 55 years? How many is it? How long have you been married? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Yes, you would be quite right. I think it's 59 years. Congratulations. Thank you. That is wonderful. Um, (laughs) And I'd love to know the story of how you met. What is the what is the romantic story behind that amazing figure of 59 years? Oh, we're British. There's very little romance. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we met um, as we're both involved in youth work. We were in business and I was teaching and Stuart was with a bank and I was down in Liverpool in a tough area and uh, somebody told me about a castle in the English Lake District called Capenray and they said, why don't you get a busload of this lot and let them sort them out up there? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had recently come to faith myself. I had no idea there were Christian centers with camps and things like that. So I went up there, and Stuart lived near there, and that's where we met. And there you go, and the rest is history. The rest is history. So did you uh, come from a Christian background, or was Christianity something you encountered later in life? I didn't, although I probably did. It's just my parents were believers but not belongers, Mm -hmm. and so we never went to church. And that I discovered later, that they were believers, but... And didn't practice their faith in a church setting, put it that way. Mm. Um, and if they'd understood how to explain the gospel to me, they would have done, mm-hmm. you know. The wonderful parents. But um, I found the Lord at Cambridge when I went as a student. I studied uh, how people learn, not what to teach, which has been invaluable to me in ministry for many, many years. And how about you, Stuart? Uh, I did not go to Cambridge. You didn't go to Cambridge? No, I went into the Marines instead. Okay. And so I had a very, very different education. (laughs) Uh, And unlike Jill, I uh, was brought up in a a believing family, came to faith as a young boy. I couldn't tell you when. Uh, I don't know when the miracle of regeneration took place. I do know that from my earliest days, I believed what I was told somewhere along the line. I must have yielded adequately to it, and the Spirit of God came into my life. But it would be during my adolescent years, I think. Mm. You mentioned uh, you got married in Liverpool and then moved yes. to uh, Cape and Ray Hall, which is the, the Christian Bible School and Holiday Centre. Tell us more about that time and, and your involvement at Cape and Ray. 
Well, we went there uh, at the invitation of Major Ian Thomas, who founded the, the ministry. At that time, I was a bank examiner, and Jill was teaching in, in Liverpool, and we were asked to walk away from those careers and go and do uh, ministry uh, at, at Cape and Ray. And initially, uh, I was asked to go there with, with my financial backing, uh, banking background to deal with that side of things. But very, very quickly, uh, as Major Thomas put it in the uh, introduction to my first book, he, he says Stuart Briscoe's uh, presence uh, at his desk is more often graced by his absence than his presence. Well, he put it better than that, <laughs> uh, but that was true. Uh, and uh, I began to engage in a, in a preaching ministry that eventually began to take me around the world. Mm. And uh, Jill, in the meantime, was living, uh, well, it's not a, it's called a castle. We're used to, call, to calling it a castle to Americans. Mm -hmm. It's a manor house, an old manor house, a beautiful place. And Jill lived there uh, in one of the gatehouses. Uh, well, we lived there, but I was hardly ever there. And uh, she began to reach out into the local area and started reaching the people in the farms and the villages in North Lancashire. And it was a great ministry there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And that was in the 1960s? If, uh, we went in 59, didn't 59. we, and finished in 70. Right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I understand, though, that, that that aspect of your ministry continues today, doesn't it, Jim? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. I bought a four-story warehouse, started a, a school in it, and a coffee house, and a library, and all of that stuff, and bookstore. And uh, that has moved into different buildings since I left it. The warehouse is no more. But um, plenty to do. There weren't any Christian bookstores at that point nearer than the other side of Lancaster, I think. Yes, but the most effective work from that time was reaching young people. And, and that ministry has spread literally mm -hmm. to the schools throughout the whole northwest of England. Yeah. And uh, there mm -hmm. are literally thousands of, of young people who have been reached weekly with Christian teaching in the public school system. Yeah. Up there. And that all came from the, the outreach that Jill started while I was absent. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. And uh, that brings us to 1970, where you moved to America. Okay. And uh, what was the reason for that move? I mean, a move that we should say that continues to this day. You still live in America, yeah. although you're here in the UK at the moment. So what was the initial reason for moving to the other side of the pond? Well, there, there were two basic reasons. Uh, one was that the, the ministry I was engaged in was itinerant, which meant that I would go probably for a week into a different place, and I would sometimes go to America for three months and go to 13 different cities during those three months and, and spend a week in different churches, uh, which was ministry that I enjoyed but I began to wish that, uh, coming to the end of a week's ministry, that I could stay there and and build on what had been placed in there. And I remember talking to Joan saying on one occasion, I'd, I'd like not just to be going for a week to these people, I'd like to stay with them. And she said, you're talking like a pastor. And I said, well, uh, perhaps I am, but I'll never be a pastor. I had no formal theological training, I had no credentials, I had no experience of pastoring a church. But that was that was one thing that was in the back of my mind. The other thing was we'd made an arrangement that uh, even, even though we were living an abnormal lifestyle in me being gone so much, uh, if the children began to show signs of reacting to this abnormal situation, we would take steps to rectify it, and they did start. And so we had a bit of a dilemma. Uh, I would walked away from my career. Uh, I didn't want to continue the kind of ministry that I've been asked to do. Uh, and I just didn't, uh, but I had to make some changes. And uh, with that in mind, I went to America on one of my regular tours of ministry and uh, arrived at a church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where the pastor had just announced he was leaving. I preached a couple of times and the church leadership came up to me and said, would you be interested in being our pastor? 
And I said, well, if the question is, am I interested, I'd be very interested, but I need to talk to my wife. <laughs> and so I called Jill and I said, how would you like to emigrate to America? <laughs> and she said, what would we do? And I said, they've asked me to pastor a church. And she started laughing and she said, you don't know anything about pastoring a church. <laughs> and I said, that's true. And you don't know anything about being a pastor's wife. Let's learn together. And so that's what we agreed to do. The church said, if you only want to stay a year, we'll send you back to England at the end of the year. And that was 47 years ago. And we're still there. <laughs> You're still there. Am I right in thinking, though, when you first um, took over the church, um, I read it was about 300 people in that, in that congregation. This is Elmbrook Church. And um, in the time you were leading it, though, it grew very substantially to 7,000 people coming a week. That must have been quite... Uh, quite the journey for you. Mm. <laughs> it was a journey of a very, very steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, I, I mean, I, what I told the people when we went there was, uh, I, I, you know, I, I said, you, you need to know what you've got here. And you're either the, 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 the most courageous or the most stupid people in North America. <laughs> uh, but I said, the only thing I can tell you, whilst I don't have the training or the credentials, I know an excellent book on the subject. I will read it, mark it, learn it, inwardly digest it and teach it. And I ask of one, one thing of you. Would you be willing to join me in, in seeking to do it? And they, they rose, mm. literally, mm -hmm. Mm. and said, we will. That's amazing. And that was where we started and that was where we continued to this day. Your ministry, Telling the Truth, I guess began in that context, of that, that church context. Um, I understand there were these things called tapes that you yes. have to duplicate. Really? Um, really? Is that correct? That's where, that's where we started. The, yes. big, the big the big tapes. tapes. Real to real. So, these are, so I can remember yeah. cassettes, but I can't remember much before that. So no. this is probably, this is pre-cassettes. Pre-cassettes. So big rolls of tape. The, the yes, there were big reels. And, uh, and then before that, there was electric wire Yes. But we didn't. We we don't go back that far. Uh, so this was uh, this was a case of people duplicating the messages that you preached yeah. on a That's on a right. Sunday and, and sharing these tapes with others. That's mm -hmm. how it all began. That's right. And then somebody came to me one day and said, "If your ministry is worth hearing within these walls, it's worth hearing outside the walls." Let me put you on radio. So we started going on radio one hour a week on one station, <laughs> and we made. Uh, we made recordings in the basement of our church. No sound proof, no, no sound, uh, I don't even know what you call it, but they, it, it was very, very Fred Carno. <laughs> Primitive. Pardon? Primitive. Primitive is a better word, yes. Wow. Yeah. And uh, what I love about the story is it continues today and you now have podcasts and mm -hmm. you have social media. Right. And uh, obviously before that, I should say, that you um, became the first ministry to broadcast here on Premier Christian Radio in 1995. I believe so, yeah. yes. Which is wonderful. That yeah. it, and that continues, as I said in the introduction, that continues to this day. You can hear, uh, you can hear the program every week at, at 10 a.m. telling the truth. And so I guess the medium has changed. You've done radio broadcasts, you're doing podcasting and social media, but, but the message has, has stayed the same. message is the same and it's still relevant. And the big thing that I, I keep in mind is that the, the, the Word of God is eternal truth. If it is truth, it is true for everybody. If it is eternal, it transcends time, so it should be contemporaneously relevant. Those two things keep me going. We have something that's true for everybody and relevant whenever you present it. And so our job is to release it. The Spirit of God's job is to take it and apply it individually to people. If I didn't believe that, I'd have quit a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a difficult t tension between a growing radio ministry and your kind of day job, if you like, of pastoring a church? Was there ever an issue there of, of feeling like you're being stretched in two slightly different directions? Uh, no, not really, because we we were working on the on the basis of what we called in those days mobilizing the pews. In in other words, we were stressing to everybody that they were uniquely gifted and uniquely empowered by the Holy Spirit for a ministry of some kind. But as one man pointed out to me, he, he's, 
He said, you can't do that to people and not provide things for them to do. They'll finish up frustrated. Mm -hmm. And he said, you are a good motivator, but a hopeless mobilizer. Mm -hmm. And so it was with that in mind that I began to think of all the things that people would like to do, uh, but didn't have the chance to do. And when I told them about the radio work and the recordings and all that was involved in that, as, as mm. we say in America, they started coming out of the woodwork, mm -hmm. all excited. And so it was, it, it was all done by volunteers. Mm -hmm. And basically what, what I did was preach on a Sunday morning and people got hold of that and did all kinds of strange things with it <laughs> and it became radio broadcast. So I won't ask you about the inner workings of how your podcast works. Right? <laughs> no, please. You, if you, you focus just on the... We, we need a five-year-old <laughs> around. <laughs> You focus just on the on the preaching and the message. Yes. You have a team around you who, sure. who handle everything. And a team that was learning from scratch in a very primitive time of of the possibilities of of uh, Christian radio and things like that. Well, to this to this day, we we have we we have a staff of just eight or nine people. Most of them working part time, uh, and but they know what they're doing, mm -hmm. and. Very, very interesting uh, in, in light of uh, the, the staff here that you have here. The, the creative people, the, the people doing the really technical stuff, uh, they're all millennials. Yes. Mm. And yeah. we love it. We, mm. we love working with these yeah. young people. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's great. You mentioned before that you were both having to learn in this initial period of setting up the ministry in the church, learning how to be a pastor and learning how to be a pastor's mm -hmm. wife. So... Uh, what does that look like, learning how to be a pastor's wife? Um, it terrified me at first because I'd never belonged to a church. I was converted at Cambridge through InterVarsity, a youth movement, nurtured there and ended up in the back end of Liverpool and started chasing my kids after school to the drug dives and gangs and stuff. They began to come to Christ and I didn't have time to go to church. I tried taking them to church, and that was a disaster because they didn't know how to behave at that point and started wrecking the joint. <laughs> so uh, I started a coffee bar. And so that lasted five or six years before I took my group up to Cape and Ray and found there was this youth center that was perfect to take my kids to and ended up working there. So I had my youngsters that I was working with there uh, in churches, giving their testimony and stuff. I knew how to do all that, but I'd never belonged to a church myself until I became a pastor's wife. So you can imagine the shock for me and the American church to discover both of us were sort of wild sort of people and who invited them to our church <laughs> but well, it was they great. excused us all well, the that's time they true. kept saying but they're british yeah that's they're, right they're yeah, british, british and we milked that yeah we did i said good 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 <laughs> but they were wonderful and they were willing to say well let's hold on let's see if it works with them and uh much of it did some of it didn't yeah, but you you started with a group of six women six just, women just meeting with yeah. them weekly teaching them, and that, that grew exponentially into literally hundreds of women, a cinema full of yeah, women. Yeah, mm. filled a cinema in the end because they didn't want to go into a church, so, so we did it in a cinema. There does seem to be a, a slight theme here of exponential <laughs> growth. Yes. You have a church going from 300 to 7,000, you have a yeah. women's ministry going yeah. from a handful to hundreds, you have an a online and radio ministry that's mm -hmm. grown across all of those platforms, whether it was the tapes or mm -hmm. the radio listeners or the podcast, it's all, it's all growing. What, on, what do you attribute such dramatic growth to in oh, all of those different areas? Well, the, the spiritual answer is, is a movement of the Spirit and the release of the Word, the Word and the Spirit, the Word and the Spirit. Um, for, for logistical answers, we, we, were in, um, we were in a city that was 84% Lutheran and Catholic. It was around about the time of Vatican II, when the when the Pope had encouraged the Catholics particularly to start reading the Bible and studying their Bibles, and uh, mm -hmm. word word got out in Milwaukee that there was a guy with a funny accent who used to preach in a cinema of all places, 
Well, a lot of the Catholics were wanting to, to know about the Bible. They had no idea where to go. They asked their priests, and met, quite often the priests were not really uh, particularly helpful in that regard. And uh, But then they found there was this cinema you could go to, so you didn't have to worry about going to a Protestant church. And that, that was one of the yeah. things that happened. In an entirely different way, Jill began to reach these women and began to to teach on a, on a morning uh, for women in 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 that original sh shape, where they were women who were not going out to work outside the home, they'd lost their spare time, and this that was the latest thing to do: go to this women's Bible study. On top of that, we rounded up a hundred kids who came out of the Jesus movement. Uh, it was a remarkable movement, but uh, but I was convinced that if they didn't get into churches, uh, they would get off into all kinds of tangents. Right, so these were people, often hippies, who had yes. lost the faith, but weren't necessarily in a local church? That's yeah, right. but integrating them into a local church was a huge issue. So we were dealing with these... Uh, many people who were lapsed Catholics, uh, m many women who were uh, up, uh, upper class, uh, for want of a better term, uh, people who, who had lots of leisure time, and uh, these these hippies, and all at the same time, <laughs> these three different groups started coming. Wow. And th th one of the nice things about it was that Milwaukee families tend to be large families, mm -hmm and they tend to stick around. They don't scatter all over the, the country like uh, like many others do in America. So once you touch the family, you mm -hmm. can be touching 20 or 30 or 40 people, yeah. which is what happened. Mm -hmm. So these, these would be the logistical uh, reasons mm -hmm. for the growth. And in becoming a church of 7,000, that would of course qualify for the definition of megachurch. Mm -hmm. Megachurch is something, as you know, from having you know, lived here and grown up here, we don't really have mega churches in this country, yeah. and yet there are many in America. I mean, other than the size involved with America being so much of a vast, vastly bigger nation than ours, other than that, are there any particular reasons, perhaps cultural differences, why the mega church phenomenon in this country, to a large extent, hasn't really ever got going? Whereas in America, there are many mega churches. Well, I think one of the logistical reasons is that America is a much more mobile. Uh, country than the UK. Um, we were we were commenting on the train coming in this morning. It was nice to see in British Rail was actually running on time. <laughs> but uh, whilst it's, it's hardly up to the standard of the railroads in Japan or Germany, uh, it's infinitely better than the railroads in America mm -hmm. because Henry Ford persuaded everybody they needed to buy a little black Ford and they still have that mentality. Um, distances, uh, distances are great. Public transport is relatively poor and rare. Uh, so people have their cars, they've got their wheels, and they're highly mobile, and they don't think anything about jumping into a car and going off to something where the action is, uh, is, is taking place. So that's one of the reasons, uh, as, as opposed to the, the UK, I would say. Um, uh, there, there, I'm, I'm sure there are, uh, are other reasons. Uh, th I think perhaps w one one of the other things is 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 this that America's uh, Am Americans uh, live in a consumer culture, mm. and the church and the, the, they've adopted that attitude to yeah. church as well. Okay. And uh, many churches have fallen into the trap. Of trying of, of operating basically on the on the, the co consumer culture uh, ap approach, and so if you can if you can become the best show in town, they'll come. Mm. Yeah. And but if if you lose it, they'll go mm -hmm. as well. And here, people have been committed to a, a local church, a denomination. They they belong to a parish and this sort of thing. And there's a, a much deeper sense of commitment than, than there is very often in the United States. So, uh, Can I just say something to that? Um, I've had Americans say to me, the Europeans gave us the philosophers and the teachers and the thinkers, 
and we gave you the sellers and the uh, evangelists who sell. And it's true in a sense. And so um, they know how to, in their businesses, how to evangelize, if you wish, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and spread their message all over the world. And so I think they do that very, very well. But when there was a chance to taste some teaching and to go deeper, for obvious reasons, because of the hunger in their hearts, they just flocked. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, was, it was such a joy, really, to, to, to teach at a, a deeper level mm-hmm. than just a very simple message of yeah. come to Jesus and everything will be fine, right. you know. But the, uh, Os, Dr. Os Guinness, who's obviously British, um, he, he said on one occasion, when, when he's an, an old friend from many, many years back, and uh, he said when he came to Elmbrook and saw the church, he said, this is an unusual church. It's a mega church built on systematic exposition of the scriptures. And that's, that's what it was right. all about, Un- yeah. unabashedly, unadorned, exposition of the scripture that brings us to the end of part one of the profile here on premier christian radio but please do stick around because we'll be hearing lots more from Stuart and jill briscoe about their life and ministry we'll be right back after this there's a knife crime epidemic in our capital city in the february edition of premier christianity magazine meet the inspiring christians bringing god to the gang leaders in the battle for london plus Kay warren talks about how her marriage to mega church leader rick warren nearly hit rock bottom and what brought them back again sam hales asks whether evangelicalism can survive in the age of trump where Sutton on what to do when God doesn't heal, and the amazing account of how Corrie Ten Boom's unshakable courage saw thousands of Jews rescued in World War II. All that plus much more. Ask for your free copy at premierchristianity.com slash free sample. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio. My name's Sam Hales. I'm the editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the magazine that sponsors this show. If you would like a free sample copy of the latest issue of that print magazine, head to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. But today on The Profile, I am speaking to Stuart and Jill Briscoe. They, of course, have had a ministry telling the truth here on Premier Christian Radio for many, many years, and that continues. But today on The Profile, what we're doing is we're going behind the scenes and finding out more about Stuart and Jill, their life, their ministry, the church they led. So let's listen in to part two of my interview with Stuart and Jill Briscoe. I'd love to hear from both of you um, uh, a highlight from your time pastoring this vast congregation, but also perhaps a story of when things didn't go so well or a particularly hard moment. Because I know, I know you'll agree that, that, that sometimes church leaders, even sometimes without meaning to, can give off the assumption that everything is great. And then, of course, church leadership can be incredibly tough as well. If you're out of the box, out of the method uh, that somebody's written a book and decided, then everybody does it. And I was. I'm always the new idea person. Um, that attracted uh, criticism as well as it attracted applause. Uh, from the wider church. So, um, and all the fact that I was a woman in a pretty conservative, I was surprised, uh, atmosphere, and especially with uh, huge uh, denominations like very conservative Baptist uh, when we went uh, where this was concerned. And so um, I ran into some pretty hard criticism from the church there when everything started to go crazy and I was doing all this stuff. Um, And, I mean, apart from how I would have done something else in the church, it was pretty grim, apart from my husband saying, no, you won't, I'll look after this. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I've got all these women in the church and I'm not going to bury their gifts. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to make sure that they all get to use who they are and whatnot. So we were criticized pretty heavily just for that. Now that's all over a long time ago. But that was hard for me. 
and I didn't need it, and I'm an evangelist at heart. I just kept saying, I don't need to work in the churches. Let me go outside. I'm doing this, that, and the other. Stuart said, no, we've, you know, we've got the women in our church. So I think at the, at the beginning it was hard. I was trying to adjust to a new culture. I was trying to... We'd left two widowed moms to go to America. It was very hard for the children to leave their grandmas, and both of them sick. And uh, our England, and come as we were, as it were. And so that kept me positive for the kids' sake. But then when we sort of settled in, uh, to get criticism from the church, that mm. wasn't, I never had that. Mm. I just had people saying to me in England, come and help us. You've got all these Christian coffee bars going. What is it? Help us, which was wonderful. There was no problem. But for me, learning how to be a pastor's wife when I'd never been long to a church was hard enough, never mind to, then to get criticized yeah. for it. Uh, I mean, your, your question, Simon, is, is perfectly legitimate, highlights and lowlights. But, but I, w- I would say, looking, looking at the 30 years I was a senior pastor there, it was 90, 90 plus percent highlights. Wow. Mm-hmm. It was wonderful. I, I'll give you an example. A low light, uh, a low light was when one a young man who'd grown up at the church went off into the U.S. Marines and came yeah. back uh, injured yeah. from Iraq. Uh, had got married in the interim to a girl from the church. He he had post traumatic stress uh, syndrome uh, and uh, got into all kinds of problems. His wife had gone into the police force, but one one night he he, he murdered his wife, and uh, was arrested within an hour, and uh, and admitted to to what he'd done. So here's a low light for you. Now we have two of our youth volunteer youth workers, one of whom has murdered the other one to whom he was married. <laughs> that's a low, that's what you call a low light. Uh, not o- not only that, you you have to conduct the funeral, and uh, you have to conduct the the, the funeral uh, as an official police funeral with all the all that goes mm-hmm. in, into that. Uh, so you've got the press there, you've got the television there, you've got the whole city is aware of what's what's going on. You've got three thousand police officers sitting in the church that mm-hmm. day. And whilst the the awfulness of the situation is is very very obvious, the the incredible privilege of speaking to that into that situation, mm. in the name of, of the word, knowing you're releasing eternal truth, mm. which is true for everybody, and contemporaneously relevant, is is an incredibly exhilarating, joyful experience, even. In the sadness mm. of the of the moment, mm-hmm. even the difficult times, we saw blessing come through them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you uh, you called your ministry "Telling the Truth," mm-hmm. which I suppose is a even more relevant um, title in today's climate of fake news, <laughs> uh, which is a phrase which everyone mm. seems to, to love to use at the moment. Right. Is it becoming harder, though, for Christians to tell the truth as arguably both British and American societies appear to be becoming more secular, more godless? Um, Is there a sense in which our culture is um, less willing to hear the truth? Yes, well, actually there's a huge difference between American culture in general and British culture in general as as far as willingness to hear the gospel is concerned. Um, Which is easier then? Oh, America is far easier. No, no, absolutely no question uh, about it. Um, the, I, I've always, I, I always thought, being a Brit myself, I, I understand uh, natural scepticism. I, I, I worry about it hardening into uh, cynicism. But, but uh, uh, I think our educational system encourages it. Mm-hmm. You question everything. I remember as a bank examiner, uh, uh, I, was, I was told by my boss, the only thing you need to remember is accept nothing, question everything. You say, well, that's British. 
Sounds like a good uh, description for me as a journalist as well. <laughs> well, there you go. So, so, but I, th I think in general that's that's the way we think. Yeah. It, it, it's not nasty. It's, it's, mm. it's sure. well, it can be, but yeah. but Amer Americans, if you do if you do that sort of thing with Americans, they're not quite sure what, what, how to handle it. No. They, it seems unkind. Yeah. It, it mm -hmm. seems rude. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 they really don't. They really don't like it. And when I come back to Britain and preach over here, the kind of questions I would get afterwards are quite a shock right. to me. Yeah, the, uh, we were we were amazed, for instance, reading in the paper yesterday uh, uh, about mm. some of the presenters of Thought for the Day. Mm. Uh, yes, yeah, so Thought for the Day presenters had basically admitted that the own uh, that their own segment in, in the Radio Four program of Thought for the Day. Um, some of the presenters said they didn't like it and wanted to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Sure, <laughs> and you know, so I thought to myself, that's the best possible advertisement for Premier Radio. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what we thought, to be honest with you, because sure. my colleagues who work on Thought for the Day do a fantastic job at making it interesting and engaging, and <laughs> and the BBC presenters said, well, the problem with Thought for the Day is it it isn't engaging and visible. Mm -hmm. I thought, sure. well, come over to Premier Christian Radio. Yes. We've got Thought for the Day here too. Well, it's it, very, it, it, very yeah. engaging. <laughs> well, it's Schadenfreude, isn't it? Joy in other people's shame. <laughs> uh, so, what what are some of the sort of tougher questions then that you're more likely to hear from? from British people I'm thinking particularly in the context of, of evangelism when you're trying to share your faith and, and and I think many would agree with you that there can be a bit more of a closed approach from from Brits when it comes to the gospel so what are some of the common objections that you'll well, hear here? well the veracity of scripture I mean it's, it's mm. fundamental uh, the antagonism very often an, an antagonism to the church as an institution um, the also uh, as, as a pretty sceptical, I, I would say almost cynical attitude to people of the cloth in light of the scandals mm -hmm. that have yeah. gone on. You uh, put all these things together, you've got a problem. Yeah, and how, uh, this is the million dollar question of course, how does the church, how do Christian leaders in this country address those problems? Well, Peter, Peter would have an answer for that. He said, let them see your good works. Uh, live such good wives among those people that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And it's a long, slow drag of being consistent and positive and gracious. A life that backs up your words, basically. Well, and you often talk about a ministry of silence. Yeah. And often it's not what yeah. you say at all. It's what you don't. It's, it's, just, it's a matter of presence in the community it, it's a matter of consistency and, and grace. Mm -hmm. yeah. And gentleness. And that, that not, even, you know. the, even, the hardest, even the hardest heart eventually will acknowledge kindness. Yeah. You, of course, travel all over the world, and I'd love to hear some stories from your travels, perhaps things that uh, us British people would be encouraged to hear about what God is doing in other far fun places, not just in America, but beyond that around the world. What sure. are some of the things that you've seen that, it, that excite you about the state of the church? Well, the, the, the two countries that, that where, we, where we sense there's a, a powerful movement of the Spirit are the two most populous countries in the world, China and India. India. Yeah. And uh, even if the, if the if the spirit of God was only moving in China and India, and the church was growing exponentially by their terms, uh, that that would be wonderful in and of itself. But there's much more than much more than that. In India, particularly uh, among the the people who are so low in the pecking order, they're not even a caste. They're the outcasts. They're the untouchables commonly called the Dalits now. There's a, there's a, a powerful mm -hmm. work going on among those. In, in China, there's been the, this remarkable work that's gone on in the villages among the peasant class, but the, new, the latest development there mm -hmm. is the enormous numbers of Chinese who are coming west to universities and going back and working for Fortune 500 companies mm -hmm. Um, and in the process of coming to faith in Christ, they are producing a whole new echelon yeah. of, of Chinese uh, Chinese Christians. And uh, 
there, there are remarkable things happening in in China and in India. Iran is another another place where uh, it's um, it's it's extremely difficult for Christians there, if if not dangerous at at times. But the the work is going on, and many people are coming to faith. So I wanted to touch on a particular political hot potato, um, but there is a good reason for it, and that is Donald Trump, because you are, to British people, spent a long time in America, you know the culture there very well, and I guess for a lot of people, a lot of Christians in this country, there will be some who support Donald Trump, but in my experience, most are scratching their heads and saying, Mm -hmm. how could so many, in particular, white evangelicals in America, the figure is thought to be around 80% of white evangelicals in America voted for Donald Trump. For, for most British people, that that's quite hard to get their heads around. And I just wanted to know, as people who've lived in America, has that been hard for you to understand? Or or do you have a bit more of a, uh, a handle on some of the reasons why he does have f- such strong support among a number of Christians? Well, uh, yes and no. That's a very comprehensive answer. If, if you think, uh, and some British people might not like this analogy, but if you think back to Brexit, one of the big things about Brexit, as I understand it, was that people objected to the what was happening in Europe and how it was impinging on Britain. And yeah. the the catchphrase, I can't remember what it was over here, but basically give us our country back, wasn't it? Something Taking back control. Taking back control. One of the phrases that was Okay, used, yeah. if you just transfer that over to America, uh, Trump run on one simple thing, and that was make America great again. Mm-hmm. I saw a marked similarity be- between between the two. We don't like the way the country is going. We don't like the people who are taking it there. We're sick and tired of trying to change them, and so kick them out. Get rid of them, and let's start all over again. Now, this guy, Trump, he could do that. The, the 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 country that they were living in now was not the country they wanted to live in any more. They didn't want to leave it, but they but they didn't want it to stay the way it but was. People have uh, people have accused that line of thinking as xenophobic or even racist. Um, so were there elements of people who supported Trump and Brexit where it where it was just a case of not liking people of different races or or nationalities? Uh, no, no question that that was part of it. But don't don't forget, America is a nation of immigrants, uh, and you talk to an American. There, I talked to a girl the other day, and I asked her what her name was. She said it was Neela. I said that's that's a pretty name. I've never heard that before. She said it's no, I'm Norwegian. So I said, oh, what what part of Norway where were you, were you born in? And she said, I've never been to Norway. Mm-hmm. You see, but she said I was Norwegian, mm-hmm. and that will happen all the time mm-hmm. with uh, w- w- with Americans. So I think that certainly xenophobia uh, is is there, and it's it's not very close. It's pretty close to the surface as well. Yes, I mean we've seen that again, particularly in in America with some of the tensions, um, which is probably not a strong enough word, but between police law enforcement and certainly a number of uh, people from from black and ethnic minorities feeling sure. like there's a there's an injustice going on here sure, sure. which the church then has to ask the question as as christians who believe in justice mm. Mm. is there a stand even if it could be seen as a political stand but is there a stand that christians and churches in that context should be making to say that actually we believe in equality and justice for everyone, regardless of their skin color. Yeah, can I say something? Of course. Um, for 20 years, I was on the board of World Relief in America, which has not, it has pretty well everything to do with immigrants and uh, the poor, and travelled for them to the killing fields of Cambodia, to an earthquake, wherever. And what could the churches in America do for the church in those places? That's World Relief. And uh, I was overwhelmed with the ability that the churches in America had to do the work of compassion or whatever was necessary. Uh, And 
it's breaking my heart because I've been to the places in the world, Cambodia and all those places, where it's thrilled me that Europe and uh, America have been places of refuge and, you know, uh, I understand. But um, I, I think the Americans have huge hearts. I know they do. And uh, willing to sacrifice hugely for the poor and the needy and all of that. I would speak up for the, for the um, hearts of, of Americans where immigration is concerned, in the past anyway. Mm -hmm. And they are a nation of immigrants themselves. Mm -hmm. As far as the... As far as the xenophobia is is concerned, um, there, I, I I don't I don't accept that xenophobia is 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 um, pan pandemic. <laughs> well, okay, mm -hmm. pandemic. I I wouldn't accept that in in America simply because it is the it is a land of immigrants. The the issue for many people is is this: there are so many people in the country illegally, mm -hmm. and there are so many people who are standing in line legally. Why should all the people who got in illegally take precedence over those who are doing it? We are a, a nation of laws. We're always saying we're a nation of laws. Why don't we get those laws fixed? Why don't we enforce those laws properly? Well, I, 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 I wouldn't argue with that, uh, that line. But when, when we find that these illegal uh, people have, have been in for years, have got proper jobs, who are contributing to the culture, have had children to raise the children, and those children, because they're raised in the country, are actually Americans and the other people aren't, and they're going, now going to d divide the families. You know, you, you can't do that. No, this is no, it. But there are no easy answers. No. Yeah. So, sometimes I, I meet people in this in this job um, who have Christian ministries, and they say that they'll they'll never stop doing what they do. They love what they they're doing. The idea of retirement is is out of the question. <laughs> um, there are others though who would say actually there's there's an important. Um, principle of handing it over to the next generation, and you need to step aside from things at various points. Sure. And I'd love to hear your your <laughs> thoughts on that question. Mm -hmm. What does the next step look like for you? Well, the, the I don't know what the next step looks like. Well, I can tell you the steps we took, and and that was after thirty years of senior pastor, twenty uh, uh, twenty uh, yes thirty thirty years as senior pastor at Elmbrook. I was seventy, and. Uh, and it was the end of the millennium. I simply took... Uh, to get uh, a sign. <laughs> I, I stepped sign. aside. <laughs> and and uh, said, you don't take... Uh, you know, <laughs> other folks take over. We did the same with telling the truth. Handed it over to our younger son, Pete. And so we're, we're very much in favour of bringing on the, uh, bringing on the, the young people as, as much as possible. We've always worked on a very simple principle. If we're asked and we're free, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we still work literally on that on that principle. So we're off to Kenya uh, in a couple of weeks again. And uh, <laughs> in, many, in many ways, uh, I, I think we could be forgiven in our mid-80s or mm -hmm. late 80s in my case to say, you know, we were just in Europe, we've got, we've got a couple of weeks back in America, we really don't want to <laughs> fly to Kenya again, but we said we were asked and we were free, the answer is yes. So what, what lies in the future for us? If we're going to continue in principle with, with, with that approach, once they stop asking us, we will promise you we will stop going. Well, I'm so pleased that you said yes to my request today to sit down and to talk about your uh, amazing mm. journeys, both of you and your mm. incredible ministry. I, I wanted to end, though, um, you mentioned much earlier on this interview about having a young team around you for, in terms of the, the ministry and you have mm -hmm. love working with millennials. And I, of course, have to declare an interest I am within that category <laughs> myself. I am a millennial. And it would be remiss of me to conduct this interview and not ask as people who are older and wiser in the faith, what your encouragement or what your challenge would be to my generation? Well, one, one of the things I would, I would want to pass on to you 
is this. Christianity is a historic faith. It is built firmly and solidly on acts that actions that actually took place here on earth in a bygone era. Um, so a, a, young, a young person would naturally be looking forward and very, very often would have little or no interest in, in history. I would say you, 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 cannot, you cannot have a healthy faith without a healthy retrospective look. In, into what what actually happened in the incarnation and the and the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ and the early church and the history of the church, and so I would say by all means be forward looking by by all means be excited about the future, but be wise enough to to to, to recognize how we got here. And recognize that we, how we got here informs us as to who we are. And if we don't really know who we are, how in the world can we take what we are into the future? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Amen. Joe, I want to give you the last word then. <laughs> <laughs> um, gift, spiritual gift doesn't age. My gift is millennials. And I still am invited onto college campuses and people say why would they ask an 80 year old to do spiritual emphasis week and all of that it's because God gifted me specifically as a teacher of that age and gift doesn't spiritual gift and natural gift actually doesn't age either and uh, there's no other answer to that but the other thing for America and I don't know about here is the break brokenness of the family very practically, our millennials have lost their grandparents because of divorce and moving and da 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 da. In fact, it's so bad the the destruction of the family unit that um, I I have a friend whose son has been divorced twice, and now he's got married again, and the his the grandparents are in tears because they had an injunction taken out against them not to see their grandchildren this Christmas because the new grandparents of the third marriage said, now I'm going to be the grandparents. And that is not uncommon, not as extreme as that. Um, the brokenness of the family, and it's given a hunger in millennials Stuart and I have literally a ministry of offering ourselves to be adopted by millennials. And we are from all over the world uh, because it's a wonderful opportunity for Christian grandparents to say, um, let me look in my church uh, and offer to do that. And it has opened to us a ministry literally from around the world. So um, it's our day. Thank you both so much for being here today on the programme. It's been wonderful to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That's all we've got time for here on The Profile. Do hope you enjoyed that interview with Stuart and Jill Briscoe. You can, of course, hear their ministry telling the truth right here on Premier Christian Radio. If you want to find out more from them, you can look up tellingthetruth.org. And if you'd like to hear them on Premier Christian Radio, just head to our website, premierchristianradio.com. And while you're there, why not check out The Profile this show as a podcast what that enables you to do is go back and hear past interviews we've done with a wide range of christians in all areas of life work and ministry you can hear those in-depth one-hour interviews with everyone from the likes of rt kendall to john mark comer and many many more Final reminder that you can, of course, request a free sample copy of Premier Christianity magazine. Just go to our website. It's premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Coming up next here on Premier Christian Radio is Premier Playback. We'll see you next week.